Hi everybody. So this is a pretty spot, isn't it? it it's, it's cold, not because the temperature's so cold, but the wind, the wind's coming off the Chippewa River here. This is, uh, this is Riverside Park on the uh, east bank of the Chippewa River, across the river from St. James. I'm here because I was in the neighborhood anyway. Uh, I got an email yesterday from the County Health Department and they said, uh, if you're a pastor and you're a clergy and you part of your ministry is to visit the sick and be with the dying, you're okay to receive the vaccine for the for the coronavirus. So, um, so I did that this afternoon. I got I got the I got jabbed in my left uh, shoulder there. And, um, saw Father Sikowski there as well. We were he, I was behind him in line. I saw Pastor Mary Erickson from Hope Lutheran there, and we used to be together in Menominee, so it was fun to see her. I saw um, Don, he, he's a funeral director, and he, I, I knew him in Menominee and in Eau Claire, and uh, he was, it was kind of funny. He said, yeah, I always, I always like going to St. Joe's. People were always welcoming him really well there. This is when I, in Menominee, even though I was a Protestant. And I said, uh, you know, I said, well, maybe they didn't know you were a Protestant. I'm just, it's kind of a joke. I think we got a good laugh out of that. So, I'm, yeah, Protestants are always welcome. St. James, and, and they were at St. Joe's as well. So, anyway, we got a good laugh. It's fun to, to see. It was just kind of a fun. It was like clergy afternoon. So, um, at the at the North High School for the inoculations. Uh, again, you know, I encourage people when when your time is up to get you know as many vaccinations as happen. The sooner this uh, pandemic will come to a a close. And so uh, I encourage you to do that when you get a chance. I feel fortunate to have gotten the chance. It'll, I think after the second shot, and I get the second shot on Ash Wednesday of all times. Um, so, and that's in two weeks, by the way. Uh, our, uh, yeah, but the, the Vatican and the uh, U.S. bishops are all encouraging us to get that uh, vaccine for the sake of the common good. Um, what else? I got a few things written here. My notes are a little loose today. But um, uh, I wanted to talk about that. Oh, yeah, we have a new order from the governor of Wisconsin, too. I don't know. But, but just it makes sense to me just to kind of get this stuff out. So trying to get more vaccines from the federal government than, than we have right now. He said, at the end of the day, vaccine supplies are limited. So while we continue to ask the federal government for more vaccines and faster we have to keep working together to stop the spread today by continuing to wear masks, stay home whenever we can, avoiding gatherings and doubling down on our efforts to keep our friends, neighbors, and families safe. So that's from Governor Evers. Um, speaking of government, we had kind of an event today, didn't we, in Washington, DC, uh, inauguration of the new president. And uh, I don't know. I'm always I'm always filled with I guess hope. You know, I nobody's ever like you know perfect in every way. But I think there's a lot of uh, uh I don't know what should we say? Keep, you know, keep hope alive that things will will be better and improve in some ways. And um, I get inspired pretty easily whenever when they were singing the Star Spangled Banner. I just got really. And I choked up, but that was beautiful. Lady Gaga did that today, I think. I had meetings all morning, so I really kind of missed. Uh, I'll have to watch the whole thing on YouTube later, maybe. But um, uh, I, I tuned in for just I pull your a helicopter overhead there. I don't know where it's going. I suppose it's going away from Mayo Hospital. Looks like the Mayo one get someone so we say a quick prayer for that person who might be in an accident and needing to be coptered or be with them and their families amen and uh anyway so i, I just saw i saw like 10 minutes or 10 minutes almost 10 seconds of uh, the president's uh, speech his inaugural speech and i thought i caught a pretty good 10 minutes or 10 seconds of it i wrote down a few notes where was it um He's talking about unity, and uh, oh gosh, I thought I wrote it down. Um, then I looked up that some of the text afterwards too, but uh, yeah, this is what he said here. He said, um, 
Unity, speak of unity today, can seem a, a foolish fantasy. I said, but without unity, there's no nation, there's only chaos. Uh, we have to see one another again. Politics doesn't have to be a raging fire destroying everything in its path. Every disagreement doesn't have to be cause for total war. And we must reject the culture in which facts themselves are manipulated and even manufactured. I think pretty much all people of goodwill could um, get behind those words. Uh, disagreement must not lead to disunion. And he had a little phrase, he called it, we're in the middle of an uncivil war. It's an interesting turn of phrase because we all hear about the civil war, but just the lack of civility, which I know is a big campaign the U.S. bishops uh, were promoting leading up to the election is to, to be civil, to be, I think so much of it boils down to, can we disagree and still love one another? And I don't, I don't know why not. And I, and I struggle with that too, because, you know, we're just learning. If we look around us, we're learning that we can't. We're learning that, you know, to disagree means to hate and, and to not talk and, and all these things. And uh, we should know better from, from celebrating Eucharist. You know, I mean, we know that we're not all the same when we're in church and we're breaking bread, but we're all, we're all breaking bread. We're all many parts of the one loaf. Um, so that'd be a, a goal I just put out for all of us to be able to uh, uh, disagree and not, not be, to be able to see that we can disagree and still be united. You know, there's something deeper than just our opinions on different topics, you know. So... Um, I, I was listening to the radio last week and there's a, a someone was telling a story about how she and her brother were very close as children and now they've grown up I think they're about my age maybe and uh, how this whole this whole election business in the last four years they're not even they're not, they just can't have a conversation because the, the politics comes up and you know they just kind of get mad at each other and then it's it's over and uh you know i experience some of that sometimes too and it's really sad isn't it and um and so I, I, the one line that she said that i thought was really she said you know we love each other and she said we would take a bullet for each other we i would give my life to save his life and yet we can't talk for five minutes <laughs> isn't that something i'd take a bullet for him but i can't talk to him and uh and so what they what they did is they they agreed to um, once a week communicate like by an email or, or something maybe even by a phone call but I think it was emails. Yeah, and she said our conversations now go like this. You know, it's like I made bean soup today. I think we had this same bean soup when we were children, and I really like it. And uh, and then he'll write back, oh, I could use some of that bean soup. I really, you know. And so I mean, the, the relationship's open. It's not real deep necessarily what they're talking about, but. She's like, I don't want to lose this relationship. You know, he's my dear brother for, you know, many years. And uh, what these uh, political differences have meant to our relationship have just almost ended it. And we can't have that happen. And uh, so similar, similar to us today in the body of Christ. We can't uh, let that tear us apart. We can disagree and still uh, be united in love. I, you know, and I hope we can continue to hold that tension so you know so often i refer to this uh story that the journalist chris matthews told about president reagan because chris matthews um worked for uh, tip o'neill the democratic uh house speaker and reagan of course is republican and and they uh invited uh reagan invited them to the white house so often for cocktails at night and um the first time uh, Tip O'Neill said, you know, President, we've been fighting like cats and dogs all day and you invite me over for uh, cocktails. And and he just put his, uh, Tip was tall, you know, they're both pretty tall guys, but Tip was a big guy. He put his hands on his shoulder and said, Tip, there's no enemies after six o'clock. There's no enemies after six o'clock. I'll probably tell that story several times a year for the rest of my life, because it's just such a, a needed story. and I. You know, I, I remember it because I need it myself. I want to be able to uh, be able to be relaxed in the company of people that I disagree with. And it, it's hard. It's hard these days to, to do that. Uh, so it's certainly how I, I hope to, 
I hope to model that for others because we get a lot of the other kind of modeling on, on television, right? But uh, not so easy. So we all, all got to hang in there. We can disagree and still be friends. Um, let's see. Yeah, what else we got here? Oh, I was reading on this kind of on the same topic. I don't have the book here. I was going to read the quote out of it, but I've been reading this book on dignity, as I've, I've mentioned before. And the thesis of the book is that it's called Dignity, the Heart of Solving Conflict or something like that. It's by a, a woman named Donna Hicks. And uh, she, um, she, she said that there's like eight. Uh, anyway, one of the, her, her thing is that the, um, so many of the conflicts that we have when people are offended and, get, and we enter a conflict, it's because someone's dignity has been insulted. I mentioned in church the other day that they interviewed uh, convicted murderers and uh, they asked them, like over 2,000 of them, what is your, uh, why did you do it? Why did you kill another human being? And the most common answer, the answer more than half of them was because I was disrespected certainly not to excuse that awful uh, sin of murder, but it, uh, it shows what an offense to one's dignity can do to a person. Uh, anyway, so this whole book's sort of about that. And, uh, and there's one of the chapters on how we can, you know, honor people's dignity and, and it was, was by truly trying to understand them, you know. And uh, she, she was doing these uh, tests with people where the, and no, the, there was an example of someone uh, was complaining about her boss to someone else that they worked with the other that was the boss's friend and the boss's friend said well i know this guy he's not like that you don't understand but so then that person wasn't heard you know and so what really uh, made things much better in the relationship was when she kind of said the same thing i'm having trouble with my boss and and to have more of a response rather than just kind of getting defensive saying something like oh you know that's not my experience of him i wonder um could you tell me more about your experience it's a whole different thing. You know, it honors the person experience. They can say more about why they feel as they do. And uh, so that's just a little tip when we're looking maybe to diffuse tension when there's someone we disagree with who's who's talking. And can you, can you tell me more? Help me understand um, where you're coming from. It doesn't mean you're throwing in the towel and giving up your convictions if you disagree. But it's okay to want to understand someone who has a different view. In fact, it's, it's the way to peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? They'll be called children of God um, so I didn't even get to parish news yet sorry I usually start with parish news um, <laughs> what we, this Sunday we have our confirmation students God bless them and then some of their parents are going to be serving at the community table community tables uh, in Eau Claire a free meal every day different time of day different days but uh, during COVID it's been a takeout meal people come and pick it up so we're delighted to have uh, our youth from uh, St. James uh, serving there. So they're feeding others. But you know, you got to feed yourself too. So Italian dinner, remember, take out February 14th, Valentine's Day pickups from 11 till noon. As of Monday, we had 75 meals bought and paid for. We can have up to 200. It is homemade pasta, manicotti, and meatballs. And uh, uh, tiramisu, it's red velvet. Uh, ladyfinger cake so that'll be really a, that's something so um and and they're gonna have new takeout uh boxes made of uh, foil i think recyclable and so it's gonna be hot 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 should be really good so in fact they might they might make it in the takeout thing and then they they give it to you and uh it should be really good so you can you can go on our website to order some of those or you can call it in Speaking of box, like box lunches, we, we'll see if we do this or not, but uh, Kelly Boudry, our great creative uh, weekly emailer and uh, resource giver for families and individuals who want to uh, have some faith formation, she's been doing such a great job for us. I don't know if you get those Friday emails. If you're, if you're not and you want them, let us know. Uh, get you on a list, but it's just, it's all kinds of things. It's, it's recipes, it's ways to pray, it's reflections on a saint, it's just, it's a whole menu of things that you can uh, choose from to uh, tickle your spiritual thirst. And uh, anyway, she's come across this thing called Lent in a Box. So we're kind of evaluating that, see if it's a good thing or not. But it comes like in a pizza box and the family takes it home and it's all these activities you can do. 
uh, with your family, um, or I think as an individual as well. Um, so maybe we'll do, that's two weeks. You know, it's crazy. It's coming up so soon. I didn't think it was two weeks away. I thought it was farther away. Uh, we'll probably try to crank a newsletter out to parishioners before Lent. Um, we're talking about having Stations of the Cross online, and uh, uh, Beth Cerny is very excited about that and pushing that project. And so I think it will get done, and it will get done well, because she uh, does things and does them well. So we're we're really happy about about that. Um, our school this week has been on on virtual, um, not because of any outbreak of the virus or anything, but I think they just are kind of trying to stagger the year a little bit to mitigate risk of. Uh, any outbreaks of the virus so the teachers are still cranking away but they're they don't have the we don't have the little kids around so if you're thinking of coming to daily mass we've been encouraging people to come daily mass tuesday thursday because wednesday friday is school mass and there's not as much room but for this week and next week uh there will be no students present so i'll be all right for daily mass tuesday we had about uh uh 25 people is pretty good for us. I know some parishes have like over 50 for daily mass, but 25 is a pretty solid number for us. And today, I think because people thought it was a school mass, we had about eight. But anyway, those masses are always at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, so kind of the things I had, we have a, uh, the Gospel Sunday is about, we have St. Agnes Day tomorrow. I wish I knew more about St. Agnes. Uh, good friend up in Menominee, Agnes, who's very dedicated to social justice and, and uh, um, has learned Spanish and has ministered to people on the border. And so I think of her whenever it's St. Agnes Day. But also, um, I was visiting a church. I don't think it was called St. Agnes Church, but last year on my sabbatical, I was able to go to, I still can't believe how lucky I was to have those months, besides the three months in the Holy Land, a, a whole week just to wander around Rome and uh, visit churches. And I, one of the churches had a it had something to do with St. Agnes. I think it was just maybe a mosaic of St. Agnes. And uh, she's one of the very early Christian uh, martyrs. I think she's in the Litany of the Saints. And uh, anyway, the, the mosaic of her was, was um, she was kind of, uh, I think she was, I think she died a, a, martyr's, a martyr's death. She wanted to maintain her, her faith and her purity in, in the face of uh, a lot of pressure not to. And, and she stayed true to the end. And um, I think I think it's just a mosaic of her with her hands, kind of like this. And but then from the the top of the mosaic, there was this um, uh, a hand holding a wreath. So if you get it like a wreath, and then the hand grabbing the top edge, and it's like it was being offered to Agnes. And you know, I assume that was the the hand of of christ or an angel or something like that from heaven and it's like you know grab this here's the reward you know a wreath can i think can be a, a, a symbol of victory you know the laurel wreath when they uh, the olympians and stuff so you know if you're ever feeling uh like you need strength from heaven or to endure some challenges uh you can maybe just close your eyes and say a prayer and imagine that that wreath of of, of glory and, and victory in christ kind of being lowered down for you to grasp and take strength from you know that was a beautiful image. I think I have a photo of it somewhere. I wish I had it to show you now. But And then on Monday, we have the, or Tuesday, is it? 25th anyway, it's the feast of uh, the conversion of St. Paul. And uh, that's that's pretty awesome, his whole conversion. You know, it talks about getting knocked off the horse and the bright lights. He actually, there's nothing in the Bible about a horse. He just gets knocked on, to the ground but on his road to Damascus. And there's different accounts. He writes about it in, in his letter to the Galatians. There's a couple accounts of it in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, but it, it tends to get associated with this, like, uh, conversion as um, sudden, sudden and dramatic. You know, conversion to St. Paul, being knocked off your horse, even though there's no horse. And uh, I don't know. And sometimes it can be that way for people. You ever? It's just fascinating. It's one of the great things about being a priest. You get to hear people's stories about how they came to faith or how they're deepening their faith and some people have these kind of dramatic stories i did not and um i think i think more common it, it's real gradual you know and even saint paul's and this is something to to know so he had this kind of one experience where he couldn't figure it out and it took him like three years to kind of figure it out he kind of went off to the wilderness he consulted with other church leaders just to kind of make sense of what happened to him so even for saint paul it wasn't just like night and day so Sometimes I think people um, 
you know, they yearn for that big sign or they, they that big change or they want to, you know, especially if, especially if things are real hard uh, for them. They just want to go, you know, right from, you know, zero to hundred miles an hour or from just dark to light. And, and that, that can happen. But uh, I think, uh, I think more often it's just this gradual learning to trust the voice of God. That God loves you, wants you to live uh, a good life, a loving life for others, a generous life for others, to know how generously God loves you. And it's a whole lifetime of just working that out and claiming that more and more. So I've been, I've been more, uh, I'm more familiar with gradual conversion than, than sudden dramatic conversion. Um, you know, anyway, everybody's got a story. They're beautiful stories. One of the quotes on uh, John Shea, one of my, he starts one of his books with the quote that God, why did God make humanity? Because he loves stories. So we should try to live our lives so they're good stories for God to read, right? Uh, and this Sunday is the call of the apostles. So first apostles to the lake shore, at the lake shore. So this isn't a lake. This is the wide, wide part of the Chippewa River. But uh, I think I'll stop talking now because it's over 20 minutes again somehow. I can't believe it. Um, I'm going to close with a, a little Taze chant. I'll, I'll move out of the way again here. I got my backpack. I hope you can hear all right. I have my backpack leaning against the phone. I may get home and find that there's no sound and I have to start over. But I had to lean it there because it's windy. Okay. I'll go English, Spanish, English for these verses. Nothing can trouble, nothing can frighten. Those who seek God shall never go wanting. Nothing can trouble, nothing can frighten. God alone fills us. Nada te turbe, nada te espante. Quien a Dios tiene, nada le falta. Nada te turbe, nada te espante. Solo Dios basta. Nothing can trouble, nothing can frighten. Those who seek God shall never go wanting. Nothing can trouble, nothing can frighten. God alone fills us. God bless you.